Hello and welcome to Dinesh Guarda YouTube podcast series powered by openbusinesscouncil.org and citiesabc.com. And today I'm quite excited to continue profiling great personalities and brands and the ones as well shifting uh, the barriers and looking at the opportunities that you can actually understand when we talk about AI, when we talk about business, when we talk about technology. Without further delay, I want to welcome to our series, of course, I think for the first time we are going to have a feature uh, about IBM and uh, as well uh, uh, a personality within the, the company that I'm quite interested to profile. So uh, we have uh, for this uh, series, Brandon Buckingham, that is a business development leader in the UK with more than three decades experience working the latest industry trends and best practice, and of course, a deep understanding of technology, ethics, and regulatory requirements. Brandon uh, spent a larger period of his career, more than 27 years at IBM Ireland, leading and managing teams involved in data, tech, Red Hat IBM AI, and hybrid cloud information architecture. Brandon is part of the IBM Data Science and the AI Elite, DSE, a team that engaged with the organizations across every industry, offering data sciences use cases and overcoming the challenges of AI adoption. Since its uh, inception in 2018, the teams have uh, completed engagement with 50 countries across six industry verticals and sectors with the leadership of nearly 100 data scientists. Brandon Buckingham combines his expertise and experience across business and industry with technical skills to help CDOs, data architects, and AI engineers to collaborate with their business colleagues and leaders to develop strategies that address some of the most critical business and technology challenges we are all facing. Brandon Beckingham, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here in our series. And uh, I'm very excited as well to understand about uh, IBM, uh, what you guys are doing, because I know that there's a lot of things happening. And of course, IBM is probably the most iconic uh, technology company in the world. Um, independent of the 100 years plus of history. And there's still a lot of relevant information that is more important than ever. So, uh, Brendan, let's start a bit uh, um, about your professional background and career. So if you can tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, my background is kind of unusual in that um, I would always argue that I um, talked my way into the computer industry on the client side. Um, just because I was fascinated and, and possibly because I wanted to work in an industry that was constantly changing. Um, and then I found my way um, to IBM through a company called Lotus who built collaboration tools um, and uh, then have done a number of jobs in IBM, um, moving from Lotus into business process management. But for the last sort of 10 or 12 years, been very focused on emerging technology data and AI in the data and AI space. Um, Really, the common passion I have is really the interactions of human beings and technology. Um, I've always been interested in collaboration. I've always been interested in data culture and how people mix with data. And that's kind of formed a theme. Um, the other the other sort of pattern, I've also evolved in roles. So I started off in technical sales uh, and then technical sales management, uh, moved to services management, and then I've then gone back to being an SME in this space. So that's what I do in the UK. Fantastic. So from your career, and I think this is especially when we're talking about uh, uh, technology, AI and data, um, in terms of your career paths, what were the the motivations and the inspiration that more, uh, I would say, pushed to be the leader that you are now? Well, so, so obviously variety is key, but um, I wouldn't say I started off knowing anything about variety. Um, I found myself in a situation where I was working in a European role and, and I needed to change, I needed to adapt. And in IBM, there's a, a big culture on not just becoming too niched too early and experiencing a wide, wide variety of roles in a, vi a wide variety of areas. And um, it's something you don't actually appreciate until you actually are here for a long time. Um, the advantage of being able to talk about your specialist area as an SME, but understand the adjacent specialist areas. So 
really it, it was I it wasn't accidental because it, obviously there was a purpose behind it. It's not something I was welcoming at the time of the original time. And once I obviously did my first big change, you know, moving from collaboration to what I would call business process management and process management or RPA, as you call it, or uh, might call it today, um, uh, you know, I, I found the exhilaration of being challenged in a new area quite exciting. Um, and then subsequent moves have always taken me out of my comfort zone. Um, and indeed, as indeed technology does, you know, as soon as you, be, you know, start to understand something, something else comes along and you're expected to uh, you know, to understand that. So I wouldn't say it was something I started off being comfortable with, but it's something I'm now um, used to embrace and enjoy. And indeed, it livens up, you know, your work day if you have to do something challenging or your role if you have to go into a new situation or a new challenge, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, with new technology or a difficult customer situation um, or indeed a new role that you find it, you know, appears on your path. Um, I'd like to say my career has been directed. Um, other than the passion I have, as I described earlier, for people and innovation, um, I would say that that I've kind of, you know, I've, I've lived in the moment <laughs> and uh, I can't say I've planned anything, um, but it has given me, I think, well, I think it's given me a lot of experience that I've really brought to every role as I've built that experience like Lego bricks, um, you know, to be able to sort of add value now uh, in the role I have. Amazing. And I think innovation and all the, the parts of technology are critical and especially how we take this and implement it uh, in businesses in particular. And of course, uh, um, one of the things I always try to talk in this series and with my audience is the importance how we take the theory and the practice and how we actually bring this innovation to the day-to-day -day of business. So uh, IBM has been organizing a very uh, exceptional event that is the IBM Think. So the just for people listening to us, and of course we'll put more information, IBM Think comprehends one day dedicated to propelling business forward, 11 cities around the world, uh, a very high profile number of speakers, a huge audience, and as well a target number of business and a digital component that is quite uh, impressive. So, um, and the, the event has been traveling around the world and the um, and they will be uh, since the 14th of June and they will be in London on the 10th of October, 2023. So can you tell us about, first of all, the event, because not everyone knows about the event. And secondly, the key topics or innovations that you want to highlight, especially on data and AI. Yeah, so um, I, the event is a very exciting event. As, as I mentioned, it's a global event, um, but we bring expertise, you know, um, to London at, at this event. Um, and really give, um, I think, customers the advantage to get, get some insight to the sorts of thinking we're having, particularly around um, areas in which we believe we're enhancing um, the way enterprises work with AI and our other, and indeed our other solutions. Um, I, th I think what's really interesting for customers attending is not just the sessions, but the ability to talk to each other and the ability to talk to the experts as well. Everyone makes themselves very available um, for conversation. And indeed, there are a variety of topics. So, you know, um, really the major topic as a high level topic is, you know, as you highlighted, IBM have been fairly intense uh, in their focus on AI over the last few years, but not just AI for AI's sake, but AI that could be used in, uh, and uh, in an enterprise to really achieve a return on investment or to enhance the way an enterprise works. And indeed, we'll be focusing on, on, on that and what we've done um, with our generative AI, or our AI solution, Watson X, and how that's focused on really sort of bringing AI to the enterprise and starting to tackle some of those areas um, that we see in the marketplace um, that take us beyond just working with a base model or working with a base piece of AI and really see how you deploy that at scale safely within an enterprise. So that's one area. We'll also be talking about our development with foundation models and the companies we're working with, um, NASA being one of them, SAP, um, and, and indeed other organizations and, and the solutions that we're building with those customers. 
Indeed, also, you know, other areas like what we're doing with uh, to enhance our own products and solutions like Watson Assistant and a very clever product called Watson Orchestrate. So there is a variety of conversations to be had at this uh, at this event, but I think any organization that that really wants to perhaps you know discuss some thinking or hear some thinking about how I take what I'm doing in my sand pit with um, models or how do I take what I understand about chat GPT uh, to a new level, to a level where we can uh, they can deliver it within an enterprise to achieve a return on investment. I think the most important thing is what can they do to make it safe, both from a reputational risk point of view, a regulatory point of view, but also in a management and control point of view as well. And I think all of those things are very uh, very good discussions that will be had at the, the Think event we're going to have on the 10th of October. Thank you. So, uh, Brendan, one of the things is, so you you are a business developing leader, and I, I wrote some text of you that you, you went through the uh, some of the history of AI and how that uh, somehow in, influenced the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. So as a business developing leader in data and AI, at, of course, IBM, one of the, the, the leading organizations, and actually one of the organizations that as well was probably one of the fathers of what we mean by AI, from the barcodes to a lot of things that were created. IBM has been on the cutting edge of that. So at the moment, what do you would say for people listening to us and as well people that want to go to the uh, the Think event, uh, the IBM Think London, what are the most pressing challenges and as well the opportunities that you see in the current landscape? And, and now you will see your insights and as well your expertise and experience to be incorporated into these solutions. Because in the end of the day, right now, the challenge is about how we bring these solutions to businesses. And I think all the businesses are panic, but we need to organize these. And I know that the event partly is to answer to this. So uh, for people that want to go to the IBM Think, but as well want to know more about this, what would be these strategies both from an AI and data that you think are more valuable for people listening to us? Yeah, no, and it's a good point, uh, and indeed, um, Often we're shocked at our heritage in AI goes back to 1947, which seems a long way. I didn't even think AI existed in 1947, but uh, there's, you know, we can trace our lineage back to then. And indeed, our our work on generative AI goes back some five years, and indeed uh, involves quite a heavy patent load from our research and development um, organisation. Um, uh, but when you will look at the work they're doing, it's not just around creating models for generative AI, but it's really about um, creating an environment um, that that can deliver AI at scale safely. Now, what do we really mean by that? And it, uh, you know, when I talk to the customers I talk to pretty much on a daily basis, the sorts of concerns uh, or the evolution I see, uh, lots of them are actually doing quite a lot with models or thinking about doing things with generative AI, typically inspired by a demand from the business because everybody's seen what Jack GPT can do. And unusually in, in a market, the business are going to the IT department and saying, you know, I can see what generative AI can do for me. They may not call it that. You know, what are we doing about it? How are we actually working uh, with it? And indeed, that usually spawns an evolution of people start um, playing it within a sandpit, as they might describe it, um, starting playing with models. And, and indeed, what then dawns on them is, is you know, uh, the risks of playing with, with models. You know, what is the data within them? What are the answers I'm getting? You know, um, are they suitable in an enterprise? They might be suitable in a consumer type environment. Um, and that starts to start some concern. And I, I've met many organizations um, taking extreme action to then ban you know, access to certain consumer models, uh, but then drive their IT department to look at other alternatives to using generative AI. So really the, the sort of concerns that I'm now see, seeing is, you know, are evolving. So I, I think one of the biggest concerns are around, is around safety. Um, we've got regulations coming along, certainly in Europe, and many of our customers are multi-jurisdictional in nature, so they have to consider European regulations. And indeed, there are UK regulations and regulations coming, uh, industry regulations coming on along for AI. And, and there should be, because it affects the way human beings 
uh, in fact, lives of human beings um, in their day-to-day -day roles. Um, and indeed, so that's one aspect. Um, we're also seeing a growth in, in fear around a reputational risk, um, which I think is, is another big issue, and one could argue it's even bigger than regulation. It doesn't take very long for a company to completely ruin its re reputation. Um, you know, I could argue at scale, um, just by either doing the wrong thing or treating someone in the wrong way in the, in the tooling that they use. So there's that, that another critical aspect. I think there, there is also a, a growing understanding that if they're going to automate or augment things within their enterprise, they need to have control over them. And, and that usually means that they have to look at it from a, a risk management point of view. They need an inventory of the models they're using. They need to understand whether they're approved for use, what they can be using using them for. Um, you know, many of these public models have have uh, legal agreements about what you can use them for. You know, uh, they will have risk profiles, as we've discussed. You might well use that GPT in your organization, but you also might have higher risk use cases where you can't use Chad GPT. You will have to use other models. This is all in the in the landscape of having a, a vast ecosystem of mo models, probably a number of clouds. How are you going to manage this within your enterprise at scale? And indeed, that, that is a concern that I'm seeing growing and one that IBM really focuses on because actually what we want to do through providing the tooling and the understanding about how you go about uh, managing this growing ecosystem is really placing the innovation back in the hands of the people who've got the ideas. And typically, we find the best people um, to innovate are the people who've been doing the job within the business for 10 or 15 years, the shop floor worker or the nurse, for example, in the NHS, who can quite readily tell you how they can make something more efficient if they understood the capability. And what we want to do is allow people to innovate with that platform and work collaboratively with the technical people that can develop those solutions to really take those on to a next level. But you can't do that if you can't do it safely, if you don't understand the risk, and if you can't actually manage the process of delivering that at pace. Because you know the, the old days where you were, used to wait two years for something to come to fruition, and it probably died before it arrived in many cases with AI, it is not economically sustainable, and it's not also going to encourage the innovation because people just say, well, I put a lot of effort into this. It never made it to production. I never saw the benefit, so why should I contribute to the next, next one that comes along? So we need to keep this innovation cycle running with the business. We need to put them in contact with, with that innovation and feel that they're in control of it and see the results qu quickly um, within the, uh, within the organisation. And this is definitely the biggest challenge uh, because, like you mentioned, there's a reputational, there's a, a readiness, there's a learning curve, and as well, how prepared are you to deal with the, all the disruption that comes out of this? So um, AI, I think right now, of course, is the, the word that is in the mouths of everyone, especially any business and any industry or sector are more and more um, dependent, at least of what is going to come out of this because it's still in the early days, at least in terms of mainstream adoption. So IBM was one of the first uh, um, from, well, the creator of the Watson, which was probably in terms of mainstream perception of AI and machines was probably the first company in the world that led that. So at the moment, uh, in terms of the, the present, uh, um, you mentioned um, Watson AI or Watson X, uh, which serves a lot of different uh, solutions. So in terms of the AI for business across industries, what are the, some concrete examples of how yeah. IBM AI solutions have been instrumental or case studies in helping companies enhance their operations, drive innovation and stay competitive? Yeah, so I, I mean, there, there are three that come to mind and two are fairly public and and and, and they're all different, different in nature. So... I mean, the first public one, some of the things we've done at Wimbledon and the US Open um, and uh, coming up the, the Masters, um, which actually uh, in tennis and, and golf, um, which actually really illustrate 
and correlate with things that enterprises are trying to do, but show our innovation. So one of the most interesting and exciting ones is we took, a, a, you know, um, the outside cults at Wimbledon and produced AI commentary. So we took the movement of the, the players on the pitch, generated uh, actually voice commentary uh, with annotated notes for highlights. Um, and that's quite groundbreaking in its nature is, is you know, in terms of two, two models working together to produce that output. Another thing we did at Wimbledon, which also reflects something that, that many organizations are doing, is uh, we, we actually predicted uh, or produced some uh, capability to predict the pathway that players would take through through the draw. So, you know, if one player beat another, what would that mean for them in the draw and the other people they would meet? And that's very much predictive in nature, but um, and, and quite interesting to look, look at in the context of many organizations. Uh, another area that I think is is really um, talks to the way IBM works within the context of the world is the work we've done with NASA recently. So we were the first people to ever take um, the NASA satellite imagery and um, produce a, a, a model to look at the effects of climate change, things like floodplains, burn scars on the planet. Um, and indeed, the model we created um, actually proved itself to be 15% more accurate than any other model in this space and actually used half of the tokens to generate it. And we've taken that model and we released it to Hugging Face um, uh, as an open model, but you'll also see us develop it further um, in terms of adding weather, uh, weather information to it and other areas working with, you know, with NASA and other groups like uh, NVIDIA, et cetera. Yeah, and it's a really co a great collaborative example of very advanced innovation that's coming out of our research team. The third example, I think, that really sort of starts to bring this into reality is um, we did some work um, with uh, East and North Hearts NHS Trust. Um, and, and if you think think about um, that organization has some six, six and a half thousand people in it. What we built is um, an AI interface to their HR system. So it enabled you know, their, their employees 24 by seven to ask questions about training, policies, registration, roles, um, all the sorts of things that, that allow um, the organization to run more effectively um, day to day. Now, um, there's some interesting figures around that which you can't relate, but uh, you know, beyond just cost savings, vast amounts of time saving. You can imagine being a nurse, you know, on duty in the middle of the night, having a query that's worrying you, that's perhaps distracting you, even being able to get whatever cha you know channel you choose to use, whether that be chat or or voice, to be able to get an answer. Um, to a question that's related to you, have that interface understand and uh, understand you uh, and be able to answer that is being a very effective way to to make the organization more effective and indeed make employ or you know enable uh, the organization to have happier employees at the end of the day. So that's a very transformative use case, I think at, at a very real level. Um, and it, it talks to IBM's determination, you know, beyond all the technology that we've talked about, really our focus is, is on outcomes, outcomes that transform organizations. So whenever you talk to someone in IBM, they will always ask you, what outcome are you trying to achieve? It's not about what technology we can deliver. And indeed, a lot of our investment and the thing that we really probably should talk about more is the investment we've made in our client engineering teams uh, and they're unusual in the way we go to market because what they do is essentially talk to customers about those outcomes. And we have very defined ways in which we try and highlight those ideas and, and crystallize them into um, in, in, in a way that we can actually build MVPs um, for, for the customer. And this is all done on our investment. So it's about trying, instead of saying, here's what's an X or here's a tool, it's about say, looking at an outcome, building something for the customer that is designed for them uh, in four to six weeks that proves or builds on the idea they have 
that then proves the value of whatever technology we bring to it. And in many cases, it's not just our technology, it's how we augment other vendors' technology to really deliver that outcome. And I think that's a very powerful thing that we do in front of customers you know, that goes beyond the fact that we're just a technology company. You know, We're prepared to invest in helping customers crystallize their outcomes and deliver it, you know, and illustrating value to them. Um, and this team is a very big team of very talented people, designers, uh, data scientists, engineers, architects, that, that bring all this together in a very effective way within a variety of industries. And we're working in, in lots of companies right now doing just that. Well, it's impressive. And of course, these three cases reflect well, three major uh, events or organizations, in this case, one of the biggest tennis event or the biggest tennis event in the world, of course, NASA and then NHS. So in terms of the case studies for business, of course, not as big as these ones or not as impactful. Can you share, you mentioned the, the products and the investment you did in creating tools and process how to take this. And I think that's probably one of the things that people are more looking for is exactly. because, of course, even ChatGPT the other day is is advanced search, uh, yeah. but it doesn't solve the problems for a business that needs no. to to solve the problem. So I know that IBM is very focused on these case studies, and of course, all these three is about creating products that actually affect the entire society. So any story or, or two that is exemplified the impact of IBM's AI solutions on, I would say. SMEs or big uh, or medium uh, high end uh, segments as well that are looking for this. Well, in, indeed, we take take the um, reference I talked to you about in terms of North East Arts NHS Trust. You know, we we you know we have some of the bigger implementations of of customer service interfaces. Um, you know, within banking, for example, in the UK. Um, so. Um, uh, so in that West Bank, for example, use uh, in their core app, you use that same technology um, to enhance their net, net uh, presenter scores and, and enhance their customer satisfaction. These are all very, uh, uh, very great use cases. But there's also a number of others that we can't talk about that really enhance you know, internal applications and, and the ways they're working. What I what I'm finding exciting in our interactions through the, the client engineering teams that we're having is it is really the new use cases that are coming on the, the things that are inspiring customers to change the way they work or enhance the way they're they're actually working. Um, you know, generative AI rise, it raises a lot of excitement, but also when you start to crystallize what it can do, it's not you know the the use cases it generates aren't necessarily destinations in themselves. You know, they're part of another process and invariably they're about speeding up a process or augmenting something that a human being is already doing. So actually it becomes critical to understand the outcome and understand that if you speed up that process, what the effect on the rest of the process is uh, and indeed what's the effect on, 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 on the people who are using that process. So I'm seeing a, a, a lot of that going on um, within customers. Uh, when I talk about the governance aspect, um, certainly we're working uh, and have been working with AI with very large organizations um, who have, for example, development environments that don't include IBM products, but are using us to bring their data scientists together, um, bringing their um, various development environments and deployment environments. So I'm thinking about companies like Credit Mutual in France, for example, and the classic example of where we've employed that level that helps them productionize AI without necessarily having to go in and, and say, you have to use our studio to develop your solutions or you know, our, our capabilities to develop them. So th there are a lot of different use cases, um, both technical and non-technical, that we see surfacing and some really exciting new ones that are coming along, you know, particularly about bringing you know, the intelligence of the organization to bear in front of individuals. So you know, there's a lot of buzz in the market around retrieval augmented generation. Um, you know, uh, the, I think the, the commonality between semantic search and generative AI, really. Um, but we're seeing lots of customer service people, uh, lots of customers saying, I, you know, I want to bring, for example, all my engineering documents to bear in front of my engineers so I can support not just the ones that have been there for 30 years, but the ones that we're onboarding with 
you know, the best information I can give them within the context of the role they're doing. So we're seeing lots of those sorts of use cases arise. Uh, the other thing we're seeing quite a lot of is generative use cases. So, you know, uh, for example, you can think in retail, there's a lot of um, PIM data um, that, that's, you know, uh, that exists. Um, and indeed, there are quite large departments turning that PIM data into marketing data. Um, and if you look at look at that process, we can generate that data um, automatically um, and, and augment that work so it's a lot speedier. And you can see that then is a step to hyper-personalization, which is a really big thing in the marketplace where actually if we can generate really effective marketing information out of the back end of that, that product-based product information that the suppliers give, it means we could also, if we know about you as an individual, generate that marketing information for you as an individual. So we're seeing lots of different use cases start to surface within this market that are going to be very effective and transformative. But as ever, each case is different. Each set of circumstances is different. And what you know, the components that people already have in place are different. And indeed, the days when you could go and say, well, you just need to rip that out, replace it, have gone. So we're very much around you know, what do you have already? Also, where where do you plan to go and how can we augment what you're doing to achieve the goal that you have? And that's that's why we take the client engineering approach in many cases. And, that, and I think this is the narrative that we need to open. And, and I, I, one of the things I've been finding is how we go from the theory to the practice, but how do you take mm. these case studies and apply it to the business and as well to each case because the dealing... Um, one sector is slightly different from the other, but even inside of the same sector, there's a lot of case studies that are different. And people really, I think at the moment, there's so much buzz around this and so much panic at the same time. People yeah. forget probably the most important things that is really case studies and really things that can actually make us move forward. So it talks to the whole thing between evolution and revolution. I think a lot of people are thinking that it, this is going to be revolution. It's going to fundamentally change, and it will on some levels fundamentally change things. But I think in many cases, we're talking about Im improving the situation and augmenting what human beings are doing. And, and that will be evolution in nature for a variety of reasons. And it should be evolution. It should be about basically improving their situation, making them more effective, um, making the company more effective as a, as a result of that. So, um you know, I think, you know, a calm approach, looking at the potential outcomes, proving those outcomes, having KPIs around those outcomes, uh, measuring them, moving them to production and doing the same is going to be critical. A, a colleague of mine is very familiar for saying that uh, AI is like a vegetable. You know, it has a shelf life. It goes off. So you need need to be constantly iterating um, what you're doing, and indeed that um, Eastern North Hans uh, reference I talked about, you know, very much, you know, that was developed out of lab services and client engineering approach to developing the solution. What's interesting, actually, when you see some of the feedback for that, is part of that process is to take the people who are are using the system their feedback to iterate that system constantly. So, what are the questions it couldn't ask? What are the things I'd love it to be able to ask? Those types of things. So for me, it's not, it's a situation of constant improvement with AI. It's not an application you put in place and then do a revision of it in 18 months. And hopefully, you know, hopefully that'll keep everyone happy. We're talking about a constantly iterative process here. And the same will be true of generative AI. You know, has it answered the question I wanted to? Did it answer with candor? Did it answer in a way that was positive? Did I, you know, was it accurate enough? All of these things are going to be things that are going to cause us to want to be on top of the way it works day in, day out, and be on top of constant innovation in these areas. Yeah, and this is the biggest uh, challenge we are all facing because in the end of the day, one thing is a, an interface like a, a chat GPT. The other thing is, like you mentioned, a mm. KPI, a net score case study for, for an healthcare, for, for a, a given organization. So when you look ahead uh, to the future of AI, of course, you mentioned the evolutionary part. Of, there's a lot of right now questions that that happens. But as well, uh, when you talk about AI is 
related with emerging technologies. And there's a lot of trends and developments. Um, so what would be the ones that you anticipate will shape more the present AI landscape? And you touched some of this, but I would like more in an open way here. And especially how is IBM position itself to lead in this evolving space? Because of course you mentioned NASA. Of course, there's not much more advanced organizations than that. But at the same time, there's a lot of, I think, uh, a need from business to come up with solutions that can tackle. Because, of course, I think especially OpenAI opened a Pandora box of opportunities, mm -hmm. but actually is not creating solutions. And I think that's probably one of the questions that I'm interested to hear from you and IBM, uh, and as well how you see the trends, but as well some of the concrete things that you can actually touch uh, and, and uh, anticipate. Well, so, I mean, the, they happen on all, all sorts of different levels at the technology level. Um, uh, you know, we're about to release some uh, curated models. So, you know, taking the content that models have onto the next level, um, you know, using corpuses of information we know we have um, copyright access to, um, you know, deduplicating it, making sure that there are no blocked websites on that. Uh, making sure that we remove hate and profanity, uh, uh, you know, so that that actually the the source data is trusted. And there's a lot of effort going on in terms of research and looking at, for example, how do I take the ethical part of my organisation, so the the body that decides how my organisation wants to represent itself to its customers and its employees, and how do I then um, allow that to feed its way through to the how the model answers questions. And if you think about that very carefully, um, you know, at the moment, that's something that's often governed by the organization that produces the model, not necessarily the organization that wants to use the model. And, and, and that can cause some big gaps in business in, in terms of, you know, if we look back to traditional AI, you know, um, we look back, back to bias, you want to de-bias a model. But if you're in the insurance industry <laughs> and you're in car insurance, it's built off being biased. You know, if you're 18 year old with a Ferrari, you're going to have to pay more money. That's the nature of that business. Uh, therefore, you cover that with explainability. But I think you're going to have lots of situations with generative AI where it's not just about um, you know, trying to improve the accuracy. It's also going to be about trying to improve the you know the intent and the way um, Jonas AI asks. Another area I'm finding in the near term that's really interesting that, that is around personas. So, you know, creating assistants with persona personas in them. Um, you know, I can think of situations where, even in my own organisation, where we have a legal person that will want to interrogate a document and improve a document using their legal language. Um, but when I talk to them from a from a business point of view, because I'm working on something with a customer, um, you know, the language I want to interpret that document with or ask questions on is, is a totally different set of business language and business terms that I then want to pass on to my customer. So I can see the use of of assistance and personas becoming more and more powerful within the generative AI space, you know, and, and, and adding in the context of the legal document, starting to produce some more powerful outcomes as well. Um, and, and I think so generally, you know, I, I tend to be a bit of a realist and I think, you know, keeping small steps in mind, there's so much we can do to enhance our understanding of how models are working, um, how we actually govern the foundation models themselves as well, not just the models they create or the use cases they create or, or the AI that's there. I think all of those, those areas will gradually improve. Um, in terms of the use cases, I think there's a, a way to go for those. I think they're only limited by the imagination of the organisations we deal with, you know, the the better understanding of what AI, generative AI and existing processes can do when they're brought together, um, you know, as the business understands those better, the innovation will really start to accelerate. And I think we're only at the beginning of that, you know, new business models, new ways of working, um, new uh, new talents we're seeing, new roles evolve, you know, who thought that a prompt engineer wouldn't be a data scientist would probably be more likely to be an in English expert um, or a language expert. You know, those things are evolving very quickly and, you know, we're all beginning to understand them. 
And this is a very good point. And I, I think this is one of the things I'm excited as well to learn more. And especially I know that uh, when it comes to um, the IBM Think, uh, mm -hmm. the one in London on the 10th, one of the things you highlight is precisely uh, connect, learn and engage. Yeah. And this is actually one of the things that is more important because in the end of the day, anything that we're talking about, uh, all of these technologies, there's really a lot of questions, but as well, a lot of practicalities that we have to consider. And as well, we can only understand this discussing, connecting, learning, but as well, taking it in case studies. So um, on the IBM Think London, um, what can attendees uh, expect uh, in terms of insights, announcements related to these future AI advancements? I know that you have as well a lot of focus on sustainability and yeah. a lot of different uh, other areas. If you could tell uh, us a bit uh, more so about it. So there'll be a big focus on, on sustainability. Obviously, uh, what's next? Because everyone's interested in generative AI. So we'll go into a, a amount of detail there. And that includes, you know, explaining what we're doing, but also having roundtables and opportunities for customers to get involved in discussions and ask questions around that area. Um, we'll also be talking about our foundation models that we're releasing, um, big, you know, in terms of you know, them being cu curated and, and transparent. Um, I think we're going to be talking about our code assistant. So we talked about an Ansible code assistant, so something that generates Ansible code. Um, but also um, we're developing and have announced a, a, a COBOL code assistant, so COBOL to Java. And indeed, we've got lots of use cases with customers who just want to document the COBOL that's there because obviously, you know, the, the, the workforce is, uh, people are leaving the workforce who maybe wrote that original co COBOL and the organization maybe doesn't want to even migrate it. They just want to understand it better. So that's something we're seeing quite a lot of. We'll also be talking about where we're taking our assistant technology, which, uh, you know, is market leading in nature. So, you know, we see it at the front end of HR applications and indeed we use it in IBM in our HR, Ask HR application, but also how we're uh, embedding um, uh, large language capability in that to really take it onto the next level, both from a point of view of training it using natural language, but also bringing better insight to it. Um, we'll also be talking about things like what's an orchestrate, which is really around how someone gets through and orchestrates their day-to-day -day role. Um, and instead of having processes, bring skills, you know, to things like hiring. Um, so, you know, being able to find the right candidates, then assemble the right candidates and the right thing, filter them, you know, be able to, you know, actually progress the whole procedure for that. Or it, it might be any process that anyone does. Um, and what's an orchestrate is a very exciting um, uh, area. Uh, clearly, ESG is a very important thing. We've got a market-leading product called Invisi, but we're also br bringing that whole generative um, space in, in that area. But we have lots of other areas, you know, process automation and, uh, and other big areas that we cover, um, uh, you know, acro across our portfolio. So there's something pretty much for everyone, and if – if if you're one of the people that doesn't want to just come for generative AI, there are talking points in a lot of other areas. I think one of the things you mentioned, which is the ability to engage, uh, I'd like to see collaborate. Um, there will be an immense amount of expertise there, and people who are just open to talking and and having a conversation and perhaps discussing discussing things like we are and getting to the bottom of things. And indeed, you know, I think there's the opportunity to walk to, up to anyone and then get led to an expert and really perhaps discover something that that, that might help. Um, or, and indeed, I think we're very open to getting feedback. I don't think anyone's got 100% of the answers. So we're constantly evolving with feedback from customers. And indeed, every day I learn something new, as indeed I probably, probably you do too. So uh, that interaction is really important, as you highlight for our market and highlight for I think where we go beyond the need to compete, actually doing better things, you know, in on the planet. So uh, we welcome that interaction. Um, we will pro we will have someone also explaining the NASA um, example I said and, and showing that capability, which I, I find fascinating and and indeed a, a good use case for collaborating outside your organisation with other bodies to innovate, which is another area that fascinates me as well. Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of things I have probably much more questions but I, I want to be respectful of your time I think especially for people listening to us and as a wrap up so 
definitely the case case studies of Wimbledon, uh, which we of course are going to put links during the interview. And of course, you can understand more. Of course, NASA. I'm actually very curious to know more. Of course, I read about it, but I want to go more on the details. And of course, even the NHS trust. I think it's a very interesting one. The AI interface for the HR system and the NetWest Bank, because I think we, like you mentioned, one of the challenge. Uh, for instance, I was in a research recently in a very big group, big project for cities. And people were panicking because some of the credit scores were putting like an entire region was completely zero. And uh, like you said, these things have to be taken out of context and adapted because sometimes some AIs don't get this. So for people listening to us, uh, thank you so much, uh, Brandon, for your time. I think well. so. So just as a, a final note, so the IBM Think is going to be on tour. London uh, on the 10th of October 2013 from 8 a.m. to 18.30 uh, and they'll be on the brewery uh, in the center of London so everyone can find information. And thank you, Brendan. Thank you. Say hi. <laughs> oh, definitely. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.